Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Ty Sharmanethrin, a Wheel of Time podcast. I am Will. I'm Sam. We are excited to be continuing in the slog in a crown of swords. Yes, sir. Sam has got us on, I believe, chapter 12. Is that where we are, Sam? Sure looks that way. Yeah. All right. Chapter 12. Chapter 12, A Morning of Victory. I did mark this one a read uh, for one specific reason, which we'll get to. And there's a lot in it that you could skim. Really, you could skim until the last sort of like subdivided section. Read the last section. But uh, I don't know. It's OK to read it. It's It's got some OK stuff in it. Yeah. So we're back with Egwene, Swan, uh, Myrell, I believe. Got a whole crew here and Lord Gareth Bryn. And so they're out riding and uh, see some riders from the Band of the Red Hand. Is it Myrell? Morel? I, I think it's Myrell, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I Morel. Uh, yeah, I I Some, somewhere around. Something there. like that. She mutters, "Dragon sworn animals," and Lord Bryn's like, "Eh, they're okay," which freaks Egwene out a little because you know she needs everybody to think they're a savage band of animals pursuing them. <laughs> Myrell loses it when Bryn says he talked to Tomanus. That's close to treason. But Bryn just doesn't care if she yells herself hoarse. He just kind of says, when 10,000 men are following after my army, I want to know what they're planning to do. And Egwene, Egwene is, uh, first off, really surprised there are so many. Uh, last she checked, the band was half that size, you know, when Matt was leading it. But apparently they've been growing as they travel, just like the Aes Sedai army. Bryn says, some men have notions about serving Aes Sedai. And uh, plus, the band has a reputation from Kyrian. They never lose, no matter the odds. But some do think that the band's luck is tied up in Matt Cawthon, and they can lose without him, which could be true. I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll see. So Myrell says some other stuff. Everybody just kind of ignores her. Egwene thinks about how formidable Bryn is. Myrell continues fussing with no one listening until Egwene just says, Shut up! <laughs> the Gwen asks Bryn to stop meeting with Tomanus since, you know, surely you've been able to figure out the man's intentions by now. So they're riding, they're riding. They pass a farm where soldiers are toting bags of grain out to feed the army. And they're just kind of taking, taking stuff from this farm. Uh, but they'll be paid. But if this farmer thought about resisting, the sight of the burned farms nearby might give him pause. And farms burned by dragon swarm to warn people what happens if you don't declare for the dragon reborn so finally we get to what Bryn wanted to show them which is a merchant caravan that's not really what's interesting though it's the rumors they bring which honestly it's like all right Bryn, why couldn't you just told them this before we went out and rode all the way out to see this caravan only for him to say well it's not it's really the rumor that they've told me you could have just yeah. led with that, bro. We could have <laughs> skipped all this stuff. Buried the lead there, Bren. Indeed. Uh, so one rumor in particular that Rand has gone to the White Tower and sworn fealty to Elida. It makes sense why Bren would find this problematic for the war effort. And Swan and Morel both look kind of peaked. Egwene, on the other hand, bursts out laughing. And so she has to explain herself. Um, says, you know, I know for a fact this isn't true as of last night. Uh, the wise ones wouldn't lie to her about this, uh, certainly. Bryn says, okay, great, but the story is still going to spread like wildfire. So Egwene says, well, you know, I could have six eyes to die, announce the truth to the soldiers tomorrow. Bryn says, all right, fine, but they better say it straight out and not dance around the truth. Which, I, by the way, this is a strategy that I feel like is not used often enough when people doubt what is going on. Yeah, like, true. That's a good point. Ha having... An Aes Sedai say, I, I know for certain that this yada, is yada, true. Yada. Yeah, yeah, they literally have to tell the truth. Yeah, and, that, that's true. That's a good point. And it would, it would only be a problem if people didn't know that Aes Sedai have to tell the truth. But that seems to be one of the few things that everyone, that everyone knows. knows. Yeah, that's true. That's like a good they point. even knew it in the two rivers. I, I think it's, it's typically the problem that our main characters aren't, haven't held the oath rod. So right. the, the various Supergirls, Egwene, they end up in these situations where they, like with Gawain is a great example for Egwene. Right. Like she should be able to tell Gawain that it's true that Rand did not murder your mom. And she should be like, okay, she she's telling the truth, but she hasn't held the oath rod. So right. he can, he has some wiggle room to, you know, believe it's conspiracy theories as we've sure. discussed. <laughs> but that is a good point. Yep. That would be useful. So, uh, Gwen orders Bryn to go on back. We, but we need to go a little further. Bryn doesn't really want to, but does as he's told. 
So Swan leads them west towards some hills, and Myrell starts visibly getting a little nervous. She knows what's over there. She realizes what Swan has been working on with Egwene. She realizes that Swan has been working with Egwene, despite evidence to the contrary. Swan says, if you want to keep something hidden, don't try buying coin peppers this far south. Okay, weird. Does hit a, a nerve with old Mai, though. She says, mother, you got to understand. Moraine asked me to do it because we are friends, but also because I hate letting them die. I hate it! Frantic now. But she does lead them the rest of the way at Swan's suggestion. Jig is up. Best to cooperate. Naseo is there with her warder, as well as Myrell's three Gaideen. Also, Nicola and Irena. Irena everywhere lately. Yeah, they, they're kind of like just in the background of every scene. Yeah. They, they remind me of the uh, the two extra girls in pitch perfect that are in all three movies but they actually make a point to make fun of the fact that they're never actually included in any of the main discussion ah. they, you know, it's kind of the way it feels they're just they're always there they're just kind of like the important part of the background yeah yeah that's true good movies swan explains to Egwene that coin peppers were very popular in shinar and malkier malkier i can't ever remember i'm malkier malkier, malkier sure Myrell emerges from a tent, followed by Lan. Hey, haven't seen that dude in a while. Mm -hmm. It does make you wonder how the show will handle this sort of thing. Long absences by key characters. Right. Anyway, yay, Lan. Back yay. Uh, Naseo offers Egwene wine punch. I don't want punch. Egwene <laughs> responds. Myrell says, two of my warders came from Aes Sedai who died and passed the bond. No sister has saved more warders in centuries. And Naseo became involved because of the mind, because this is the disease of the mind that happens to warders when their eyes to die dies. So Myrell tries again. It's no different from a woman deciding who should have her husband when she dies, so he ends up in the right hands. <laughs> Swan says, we ain't all Ibo Dari lady, jeez. <laughs> and a warder isn't a husband for most of us. Myrell's head comes up defiantly. <laughs> Can I just say my favorite typo is when someone writes defiantly instead of definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I defiantly sent that TPS report, Steve. <laughs> Such vigor. That's always yes. fun. You see that on Reddit a lot. <laughs> Swan says, uh, even if there's no law against it, you didn't give Lan a choice. It's like rape, really? Myrell says, as soon as he's safe, I'll pass the bond to Nynaeve. And Egwene interrupts, says, wait, you're going to do that? Are you having any luck? RL says it's only been two weeks. <clears throat> well, maybe it's time to try to something different, Egwene says. So she walks up to Lan, who is practicing sword forms. He whirls and the blade stops inches from her face. Lan says, I heard they raised an Amerlin, but not who? We have a good deal in common. And Egwene says, Nynaeve is Aes Sedai now too, and in need of a good warder. This earns a laugh from Lan, who says she'll need a hero out of legend to face her temper. And the laugh convinces her. So she says, I'm sending you to Ibudar to act as Nynaeve's warder. Her safety will be in your hands. Marel protests, and Egwene explains herself. This is the best way to keep him alive. Put Nynaeve's safety in his hands. She loves him, and he loves her. Naseo says, no way. Well, women have been trying to chase this man his whole life. Marel says, that explains and trails off. What did you try, my... So Egwene has similar thoughts. Probably best Nynaeve never hear about that particular detail or else she might, you know, go crazy. <laughs> Upon my first reading, I did not pick up the implication at all that Morel had been betting Lan. And fair enough. Yeah, I, I kind of I kind of read it as she like tried and he just was like so messed up that it didn't really go anywhere. That, I don't know. I, that's I was going to say, like on my second reading, I'm still not sure she did. Right, right. And I think she tried and he just was not interested. Right. That's kind of my impression. And it's funny because like in the wiki, it just says it says, you know, oh, yeah. And she's been betting land. I see people just talk about that and they even say that she raped him. Oh, I, th I think she raped him in the sense of the the bond, the bond. but not yeah. physically. Yeah, that right. Seems strong. Yeah. She seems to have a genuine interest in the, the health and life of the warders that she takes on. Mm -hmm. I just I don't think that's in her character. I, yeah, I don't think it's it's like a perverted thing. I think she was probably making a pass at him because she thought it would help him not die. Right. You know, yeah. like, well, if I can comfort you in my bed, then you will not want to go fight Trollocs and kill yourself. 
that's yeah. probably the kind of thinking. Yeah, I, it's funny because there's there's a lot of stuff like this in the book where I think, you know, one person can read it and say, oh, OK, she made a pass at him and he didn't take the bait. Yeah. And another person can read it and say, like, oh, no, she she totally aggressively right, you know, right, took yeah. him against his will using the bond to force him to do stuff. And neither of those things is said explicitly right it would be all subtext to to jump right. to that conclusion yeah and and so i mean i i can't say for certain that she didn't i don't sure, think she sure. did yeah it, um, all we have is what's in the text really you know that's right. like that's my usual approach is like well if it didn't say that she did then she didn't you know right yeah i mean i tend towards that as well um versus you know we're gonna see something else in the text later on right but you know there's several places like that where and and when i see people talk about like the content how some people can be like, I don't know, it's content's not that bad. It's kind of, you know, it's, and then other people will like list off things that I'm like, I don't remember that happening. Or right, this happen right. Yeah. It's like they extrapolated that and they're remembering it as fact. And when it's right. not actually explicit, you know, something yeah. they read into it. Yeah. Now I'm with you. Uh, so then Arena and Nicola have been blackmailing Morel and Naseo, apparently better than they did Egwene. So Egwene puts a stop to that. And she skims land to the place she dropped Nynaeve and Elaine, which is five or six days from the city. She tells land that uh, Nynaeve is in the Terrasen Palace. Maybe be a little circumspect about protecting her. You know how she gets. Everyone knows how she gets. Something primal rages in land's eyes. Dude wants to get in a fight with some folks. That's to say the least. So she leaves him. Egwene skimming vehicle thingy as a barge. Which is probably a better choice than the Silver Surfer Aes Sedai disc thing that Rand uses. You know, probably harder to fall off a barge. But mm -hmm. at the end, Land smiles and says, the watch is not done, and leaves. And Egwene skims back, sets Swan to dealing with Arena and Nicola. Uh, why are we still hearing about these two? I just... <laughs> done. <laughs> she does make Myrell and Naseo swear, swear fealty to her in exchange for her protection. They won't lose their warders. They don't like it, but they do it. Make sure that they won't tell anyone that Swan and Egwene are in cahoots. And yada yada, got to obey orders from Swan just the same as from me. Swan says, there's not a hint of this in the secret histories. You're doing stuff no one else has ever done. Egwene says, Nicola and Arena tried to blackmail me. And Swan's like, well, maybe we should kill them. Egwene says, nope. Uh, if I approve of killing them, who's next? Romanda, Romanda and Lelaine. Well, you know, yeah, that's the idea. <laughs> Weren't you paying attention in Amberlin school? Uh, but no, we won't. We won't have this victory spoiled by murder. Back in her tent, Egwene has letters for Bramanda and Lelaine about, oh my word, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing way too much Aes Sedai maneuvering this chapter, and it is so exhausting. <laughs> and the stakes are so low, and no one has thrown a fireball in so long. <laughs> hey -o, Slago. <laughs> anyway, oh, well. yeah. Halima comes in and says, Delana is putting the declaration about Elida being a dark friend before the hall today. Gives Egwene a scalp massage to help her with her headaches. And so I guess these are like little tiny weaves of fire from Sidene. I don't know. Probably. Something like that. Egwene thinks about how women think Halima attracts too much attention from the fellas, but Egwene doesn't mind her. Plus she, plus she likes that Halima never mentions Egwene's headaches to anyone or the or the yellows would probably be ambushing her to help out. You know, of course she's not going to tell anybody. <laughs> right. Yeah. Somebody might uh, catch on to, wait, wait why, what? Yes. Uh, hmm. Hmm. So uh, Gawain sort of daydreams about how she's so close to being able to bring Shiriam to heal and how nice that'll be. Mm -hmm. So chapter 13, the bowl of the winds. This is a read. Oh, at last, the bowl of the winds. We found we it. Go. The slog is over. Nope. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be into perspective chapter. Yeah, okay. So I looked it up. The last time we had one of those was Lord of Chaos, chapter 19. Uh, well, so not that long ago. The only other one Jordan wrote is in the Path of Daggers. Oh. But for some reason, there are eight in the final trilogy. Yeah. Um, it, you know, Sanderson did tend to check in on everybody more often from their yeah. own perspective, but maybe he's a fan of the character. She's that, that could be it. So yeah. uh, Avienda is a bit seasick. The Aiel don't have experience on boats, obviously, much less the ocean. She muses uh, about how weird it is to be in so much water and not a drop of it fit for drinking. Focuses on her dress to distract her. Not used to silk dresses, and now she owns four. So Elaine asks Nynaeve if they should be worried about Arena and Nicola. 
and wonders what they should do. Kill them, obviously. Avienda puts in. <laughs> Aio perspective. Consistent, at least. Got to give them that. Birgetta agrees and says they really should be worried about Merrigan, though. Nani says if she comes again, we'll deal with her. Do you think she will? <laughs> Elaine says, you know, no use worrying about it. We'll just have to be careful. Seems very chill about the fact that, hey, we had a Forsaken that we hung out with for a long time, and she may have heard things about things. And, and just, now she's loose. She's the juice loose. She's loose. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, very, very cavalier about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you would do, but... Right. Yeah, you definitely seems like I would I would be like, should we be weaving some kind of word? I don't know. <laughs> Sam and I are both anxious kind of people. Yes. So <laughs> that's probably part of the different like Elaine may just be like, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> You do what you got to do. Yeah. yeah, move on. <laughs> right, right. We got other problems. Probably the best way to be. So Avienda says, uh, maybe we should use Matt to help search for the bowl since he's severe in. And Nynaeve says, not on your life. I would not endure the man if he had the bowl in his pocket. <laughs> Elaine <laughs> says, shut up. And why didn't I think of that? You know, if if you get tired of the bowl of the winds of its whole uh, subplot, then you could just pronounce it the bowel of the winds <laughs> in your head. <laughs> right. And that just makes it a little funnier. It does. Yeah. Everybody looking for the bowel of the winds. It's very <laughs> true. That's a great tear anger ale. Real useful for, you know. Uh, so... There's some back and forth, yada yada. Elaine raises a chin because pretty much always is raised. Nynaeve points out that Matt will want his soldiers to come too if they take him searching. No way they'd have any luck searching the Rahad with a bunch of soldiers. Elaine points out the benefit of having a Tavirian help, help them search, plus it lets them keep an eye on him. Nynaeve says, whoever asks him will have to beg and I'd sooner marry him. Some sitcom that'd be. <laughs> Uh, Elaine says, Birgetta can go, and Birgetta looks afraid. He says, uh, if you recognize you, you've said something already, which is confusing to Avienda. It does help Birgetta, though, who says, I should have known you get back at me for saying it's a good thing your bo bottom wasn't any, and trails off. I don't know <laughs> what she was going to say there. but So they go out on the deck, and Elaine looks at Avienda and says, distances over water bother me. I will look at the sh ship and nothing else. Avienda thinks that makes sense as Elaine can be delicate sometimes. Um, she looks out and sees water for miles, and then she turns back and says, I am a fool, Elaine. A wise woman listens to advice. It's clearly seasick. And uh, <laughs> Elaine takes a deep breath and says, tonight we will talk about Rand. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, because, again, can't pass the Bechtel test. Yeah, 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 there you go. True. Every every now and then in these Aes Sedai moments, we do. But yeah, otherwise. They already talked about Matt. It's just funny, like how they'll be going along talking about, OK, we got to get the bull of the winds. We got to go do this and everything. How's Rand doing? <laughs> right. That's a good point. <laughs> He's the center of their world, unfortunately. So Nynaeve is yelling at someone. And so, of course, Elaine has to go fix it. So Nynaeve is yelling at some Seafolk men to let down a rope letter, let them on board. Surely calling someone an earringed buffoon will convince them to do what you want. So <laughs> Elaine says, I'm Daughter Air, Green Aja. Uh, we don't want the gift of passage. We just want to chat. Thanks. We know the weaving of the winds. We know about wind finders. That has an impact. Dudes vanish. Nynaeve says, only a ninny thinks she can threaten people and get anywhere, which makes Avienda laugh. Hey, you know, I yield humor that sort of makes sense. It doesn't involve water. Shocker. Maybe she's been around wetlanders too much. But something she said worked because a piece of wood between two ropes is lowered for him to sit on. Kind of like a swing, I guess. I don't know. So Nynaeve warns the sailors not to watch her, you know, get lifted up because she's wearing a skirt. And one does anyway. And Birgetta punches him in the face. So they don't watch her go up. Avienta <laughs> pulls her belt knife and hurls it into a, cr a post across the like across the deck, <laughs> causing all of them to duck for cover. <laughs> <laughs> Which like this scene alone would make this chapter worth reading. At least read this scene. Right. So she retrieves her knife but doesn't sheath it, and they so they definitely don't watch her go up the ladder. So maybe she's she she thinks maybe I am getting a feel for wetlander customs. <laughs> 
<laughs> they're just like, oh my gosh, they're going to knife me. <laughs> so a woman greets them on the deck. Mer- Malin Dintoro, breaking wave, wave mistress of Clan Somarin and sail mistress of the Wave Runner. So many you know, titles. They're there needs to be one of those things where it's like, you know, you combined like, you know, your street name and you're this and you're that to get your a sea folk name. <laughs> right. That, that does sound like a Facebook right. quiz you could take. Bubba breaking wind. Um, <laughs> I like that one. That, that's a good one. Uh, so, uh, Melindin weeds them to the back of the ship where a white haired woman is studying a map and clearly in charge. She looks at Birgitta and says, You are an Aes Sedai. And Birgitta says, By the nine winds and Stormbringer's beard, I am not. You know, I don't know what uh, Thor's hammer has to do with this. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, makes the white haired lady jump. Uh, she says the same to Avienda, who introduces herself. Nine Valley Sep, Tardat Aiel. Hi. White hair introduces herself as Nesta Din Riaz, Two Moons, Mistress of Ships to the Athian Mier. Bobana Fana. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Just adding to the names. Exactly. So Elaine says, we're here for two reasons. We want to know how you mean to aid the Cormor and to get the help of your Windfinder, who we haven't met yet, who is Doril Din Iren Longfeather. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Nesta isn't pleased about the weaving or the Cormor prophecy. Who told you, huh? I'll beat him up. So an old man in the corner says, a split sail is split, Nesta. Maybe we should hear him out if they are Aes Sedai. With a look at the Windfinder, who says the three of them can indeed channel strongly. And I said, I never ask aid, Baroque. Nesta replies, oh, hey, Baroque. This is my first World of Warcraft character. <laughs> it was an orc warrior. I, um, you know, it just was like going down a list of Wheel of Time names. It's like, oh, Baroque. I didn't even know who it was. Like, that sounds like <laughs> a good name. Otherwise, I tend to oh, hey. stick with uh, Forsaken. I had an undead rogue named Ishmael, Blood Elf Paladin named Samael, a Taran Druid named Demandred. I didn't even know who Baroque was, but, you know, it seemed like a good Well, name. you know what I say. If it ain't Baroque, <laughs> you know, don't he is, fix it. He is kind of cool. He's an old and crusty pirate. Like, it's great. I like it. Convinces Nesta to hear them out. So Elaine explains they are looking for the Tyrangriel. Duriel says, it's the bowl of the winds lost for 2,000 years. You have it, don't you? So the shipmistress tells Avienda... Or tells Baroque to summon the other wave mistresses and the first 12 and Sinti. So Doriel asks Savienda if an Aiel woman must kill a man every day, and if so, how are there any men left? <laughs> also, <laughs> do Aiel women tie a man down when you and he, when you are many Aiel women as strong in the power as you? <laughs> Avienda asks if she has a bucket. <laughs> so on to, man, that was a long, ch- a long chapter with. Very not very much going on, but you know some things. Yeah, uh, but it's a fun chapter. It There's is, a, yeah. You know, I mean, I I, I want to make sure that people know we like these books, and so when we say like skip or skim something, we're not saying that we don't like these books. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's not enough there that's like fun to make up for the fact that not enough happens. Is kind of yeah, the way uh, that. You yeah, know. exactly. When it's it's the it's a common criticism you hear about these books that like and I, I have literally have a friend who got to i think he got to book nine and he's like i just stopped i lost interest it wasn't for me anymore it just was it was boring and it's like it's a, it's something you hear you know the people stop during the slog and then never right. finish and which is a real shame because the ending is so great you know, right even even knife of dreams is good you know and like yeah so that's the reason we we sort of talk about it critically because it is it is like it's a shame that this is a fact even though right. I'm enjoying I'm enjoying this you know this whole process yeah. of reading them and talking about them um, but you know I want to be upfront with yeah. people like about what's happening yeah, for sure all right so chapter fourteen white plumes we'll label this one another read it's a matte perspective walks into the silver circuit which is a place for horse races. He, uh, he thinks that Ibudar likes grand names for inns. Uh, the grimiest inn smelling of old fish was called the Queen's Glory and Radiance. <laughs> <laughs> Poor folks get to watch the race for free, and in a separate cordoned-off area, rich people gamble on them. Uh, 
Uh, so Matt motions one of the bookies over and tells Nalesian to put all their money on wind, which is Oliver's horse. And Nalesian is nervous because there are two new horses in the race today, but Matt has taken a look at them already. And one of them is a piebald with that has a, apparently has a clubbed tail and is already half mad from the flies, Matt says. The dun is showy, but has a bad angle to his fetlocks. I gotta say, I know Excuse me? about horses. I can't tell if Robert Jordan is just making up words at this point. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, the quad steps on that one's left nostril are crooked. <laughs> yeah, I, I, now I I am going to challenge myself to at some point over the next work week to add like to slip in. He's got a bad angle to his pet locks. <laughs> that is good. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. So there you, you guys <laughs> let us know if you uh, manage to slip in somewhere. He's got a bad angle to his fetlocks and just shrug. Yeah. Don't break. You've got to, you've got to keep a straight face when right, you say, right. No it's, explanation allowed. Mm, even if you're talking about your, your dog, your car. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. So Matt, Matt's luck doesn't work on horse races, but his dad taught him horse flesh. So he doesn't need it. Nalesian is still worried, though, because he wants to take a seamstress out on a date and can't do it broke. Matt's not worried about losing, though, if he, though he is a little worried about Oliver getting hurt. There's no rule against using the horse whips on other riders, and he's, you know, doesn't want that to happen. So Jewel and Sandar walks up to them through the crowd, tells them, tells them that Supergirls have left the Terrazin Palace and hired a boat, and Tom sent a man to follow them. Uh, Matt sends him back to the boat landing to figure out what the ladies are up to. Uh, Matt sees a lady he recognizes but isn't sure why. Talks it up to a face from the memories the stakes and the foxes gave him. But it reminds him of a knife for some reason. So uh, the Supergirls have been actively avoiding him the past five times he's visited the Terrazin Palace. And he figures they just want to keep him from interfering in whatever they're doing. He might have a rough way of going back going about it but is genuinely concerned for their safety and naturally the ladies don't feel they need his need or want his help at all rogue with a heart of gold our matt mm, yes so the horses line up to race nalesian is nervous as a long tail long tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs and um, matt says be easy you'll tickle your seamstress under the chin yet whatever that means another one you can try to slip in <laughs> yeah somewhere. yeah exactly Ten strides, Oliver is riding wind, has the lead. The Dunn is right on his heels. The Legion moans. They shouldn't have wagered everything. Okay, honestly, do we really think Oliver is going to lose, lose at this point? Do we care? No. No, we do not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Matt is distracted by the lady and abruptly remembers that she is a dark friend that tried to kill him and Rand back in book one. A stable in Camelot. Oh. There was like a cavalcade of dark friends that showed up around then, and they all kind of ran together. Right. I think actually I listened to the podcast, A Cavalcade of Dark Friends. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I just launched a podcast by saying that. Somebody is going to hear that and be like, yeah, that's the name of my Wheel of Time podcast. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, you can have it. Good. Welcome yeah. to it. Yeah, we've got a name. We're good. I <laughs> <laughs> don't want to change our web URL. <laughs> it just renewed for another year so so matt has holes in his memory so it's no surprise he didn't remember this dark friend lady oliver of course wins the race shocker uh, matt said tells nalegian to collect oliver and their winnings and head back to the inn uh nalegian asks matt where he's gonna go and he says i saw a woman who tried to kill me and nalegian says give her a trinket next time <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Matt follows the dark friend lady through the city, ducks into a stall, overpays for a signet ring that gets stuck on his finger. Um, I don't know if this comes back later, the signet ring. It's kind it of does. described very uh, a lot. So, okay, fair enough. I, th I thought it would, but I totally don't remember at all that. It would. Yeah. <laughs> I completely forgotten about this. <laughs> Matt mutters, who in the pit of doom lives there as he spots her walking to a palace? Scrawny white haired dude says, Keridan. Matt can't believe that the ambassador of the Children of the Light is hosting a dark friend, but he doesn't get, want to get involved with the Inquisitors. So Matt looks up to thank the man, and he's gone. Uh, Matt thinks he's familiar, can't place why. Suddenly, Matt feels the dice tumbling in his head again. So, chapter 15, Insects. This is another read. I, I know a lot of these are read, uh, and I usually have a reason. Uh, but this one, because, hey, an actual Forsaken shows up, you know? I mean, so... Yeah. That's pretty cool. Uh, so, Keridan perspective. <laughs> if 
talking to that dark friend lady whose name is Shaney, Shane, Shaney, I don't know, Cheyenne, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> uh, that's her dark friend name, like Boris is for Keridan. Her real name is Millie Skein, and she's a renowned assassin in dark friend circles. Lots of five star reviews on the dark friend social app or <laughs> five pentagrams or whatever. <laughs> you know, that really makes me think there isn't that much satanic imagery in these books. Sure. Kind of interesting. You didn't choose to go that route. You know, it's more eldritch or Lovecraftian than biblical right. on the whole. Can't think, you know, it's not like there's any goat sacrifice or heads bitten off bats or anyway. Yeah. <laughs> not that kind of stuff. So Millie Skein has a, screw, a crew searching the city for Cash of Angriel, Tyrangriel, Sangriel for Caradin, uh, who's doing it for Semael. So Shean says she can't have her people openly asking questions about the One Power, or you know it'll attract attention. So Caradin looks out the window and sees Matt, and he's reminded of Ishmael with a face of fire, showing him the faces of the three Taviran. As promised, we do get our Forsaken. So Semael like. It's almost like he freezes time, but he, you know, obviously that's not the power level of Samael. He's sort of a right. two-bit two forsaken at this point. So I guess he sort of just paralyzes uh, Shiani. I don't know. <clears throat> so Keridin kind of tells him that he saw Matt, and Samuel says, well, that's weird that he's there, but I don't want you to kill him right now. The main thing is find me my trinkets, my Tyrangriel, Angriel, and Cyangriel. And so Samuel also basically says, I've recently killed your favorite sister and I'm going to continue killing your whole family, you know, so please continue doing what I've said or you will also end up in a Trollocs cook fire. Caradin's like, OK, I will do that. <laughs> uh, it, it's messed up because he's kind of like not he's a little bit sad that his favorite sister has died, but he's mainly like, well, better off her than me. <laughs> <laughs> like, maybe I can still do well here. He's just a terrible, awful dark friend, really. You know, I, I mean, I've touched on this before, but it's just so clear that the whole dark friend, dark great lord kind of group is just a real toxic work environment. Yeah, they're they're a bunch of douchebags. I mean, really. And, and I'm just thinking, you know, it's Daniel Pink as a business consultant did a whole thing on the third drive where he talks about everybody thinks you need a carrot or a stick. And if people aren't doing what you're doing, you need better carrots or sharper sticks. And it's like over in the, the dark friend camp, it's just like they just keep poking each other and yes. like, hey, do this. That's uh, it. Bigger stick. And yeah, and that's yeah. it. But they never think, you know, if we could really get them on board with the Dark Lord's cause to, you know, like obliterate the wheel and all that, then yes. we wouldn't have to threaten them anymore. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just trying to, you know, if there are any Dark Friends listening, you guys yeah, just really improve advice for you here. Improve your process. Yeah, and I mean, to that point, exactly. After Samuel leaves, Shian wakes up and uh, Keridan just chokes her. <laughs> and he was just like and he like stabs an ant and is like you're like this ant <laughs> and it sort of works she's like okay master i'll do what you say you know because you choked me and stabbed that ant <laughs> so. i i almost i almost feel like in this in this moment we haven't been given a clear enough thing like Cardin has been such a innocuous dark friend yeah he's, yes he's usually been the victim up till now right and so I think it's kind of like, hey, we need a moment to remind you that this guy's evil, too. Yeah, right. So, He's still he'll kill you, too. He just doesn't usually have the chance because somebody else is usually choking him. Right. <laughs> Shardar Haran or one of the Forsaken or various exactly. other people. You know, and so this it's crazy that we haven't had almost any Forsaken up to this point other than Masana at the very beginning. And we're right. In chapter freaking 15 here. But after this point, and you know, we're not going to get to this in this episode, we do get a good bit more, which is sort of refreshing. We've had all these like checking in with all these two bit villains and all this Aes Sedai politics and stuff. But we do get we do get back to Samael and some and other Forsaken, um, oh. which is fun. So that's something to look forward to <laughs> later Indeed. in this book. So chapter 16, a touch on the skip, a touch what? on the skip. <laughs> <laughs> Touch on the cheek, skip for the love of the light. Skip this chapter. This is an awful chapter, um, but we will tell you about it. Yeah. So Matt is headed to the Terrazin Palace because he wants to leave a message for the Supergirls. Walks up to a line of honor guards at the front gate and says, "Hey, 
I need to give the ladies a message. And I, I've kind of pictured this like walking up to a red coats at Buckingham Palace. You right. know, although these guys actually respond and they're just kind of like, what? No, what? <laughs> and so they <laughs> usher him through a little small door and uh, hand him off to a maid who hands him off to a manservant, who hands him off to another manservant, and so on and on until Matt asks a round woman named Lauren how far he has to go to leave a note for a pair of Aes Sedai. This isn't the bloody White Tower. Then a voice behind him says, if you do seek two Aes Sedai, you have found two. Ah, oh, shoot. It's Teslin and Jolene. Jolene. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know we, we've done that already. We but. will do it again. I started to do it myself. <laughs> so now you've stepped in it, Matt. The two eyes that I from Elida and one of them's a red. So Jolene tells him that Nynaeve and Elaine are on dangerous ground and blind to the danger. So you need to lay off them. <laughs> also, you should never have left the tower. Then Adelius or Vandine, whoever it is, grabs his coat from one side and Teslin grabs him from the other. And it's a mad tug of war. So they fight over <laughs> him for a minute until Lauren interjects and says, the queen has summoned Master Cawthon and I need to bring him straight away. So after they, so the Aes Sedai sort of grudgingly say, all right, fine, whatever. So after they get out of earshot, Matt says, brilliantly done. Thank you, Lauren. Now, if you could please show me to Nynaeve and Elaine's room, that would be great. And Lauren says, oh, you thought I was kidding. Nah. Queenie summoned you for real. So uh -oh. Matt goes and sees her, and she's real inappropriate. And he thinks, man, if she was a few years younger and not a queen. And she introduces her son, Besselin, who ropes Matt into going to festivals with him. And we all cringe to think how long this storyline is going to take to end. <laughs> yeah, it's getting started into a uh, direction of a lot of what's going on with the slog. And it's it's, it's not totally uninteresting. It's it's turning Matt on his head, but it yeah, does. Yeah. It just gets t so dragged out. Uh, like, and this one and this one gets downright um, unpleasant. And right. we'll get into that next episode or whenever. Sure. But it definitely is one of those like, oof. Yeah. Man, what are you thinking, yeah. dude? All right. Well, I think that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks for joining us. Um, make sure you subscribe if you're not already, wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're at it, yeah, it'd be pretty awesome if you left us a review. It'd be great if it was a good review. Yeah. And uh, share us with your friends who are also into the Wheel of Time. Um, a lot more folks getting into it these days. So True. this is good time to be like hey i've got this podcast that's aggressively okay that you should check out so <laughs> you can always reach out to us on our socials podcast tsm on twitter instagram and the book face or you can visit our website at tsmpodcast.com we've got a contact form there just you know fill it out if you say something nice uh, we'll probably mention you in the show and we'll definitely respond to you and you know i'm busy a lot of the time but i'm never too busy to receive a, a an email from people who have enjoyed our podcast um like I, we said in the past episode it's kind of the only payment we get at this point yeah true um, thanks for listening and until next time tyshar manethrin